Well, let's follow up on the new travel measures introduced by the federal government today. Rewa Dionandan is an epidemiologist and associate professor at the University of Ottawa. He's a frequent guest on CPAC and is with me again this evening. Uh, professor Dionandan, first of all, good to see you again. Thanks for your time again. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the federal government's advisory uh, issued today? Now they've re, uh, reposted their advisory against all non-essential international travel for the next four weeks. What do you think of that? It has to be done. It's not going to solve the problem in and of itself, but it's going to help a little bit. Our goal here is to slow transmission as much as possible, to buy time, to vaccinate and the other tools in position. So uh, our non-essential travel is a source of importation of Omicron infection. Anytime we can prevent that from happening, it's, it's a good idea. How, how big of a source is it? Uh, I'm hearing some of that today, competing uh, sort of thoughts and, and opinions about whether th you know this, this is a big source of of, uh, of spread uh, for, uh, right. for COVID-19 or not? Well, 100% of new cases prior to the existence of Omicron in Canada were due to travels. That's how it arrived here. Now, it's already here, so it's spreading. And the argument is, well, why bolt the barn doors after the horses have fled? However, numbers matter. We don't want to increase the number of imported cases that can serve as point sources for further outbreaks. So in my opinion, anything we can do to slow that growth, even though this might not be a high impact policy, it's probably worthwhile doing. Uh, again, this is a travel advisory. It is not a travel ban. So it leaves the choice at this point to individuals to follow the government advice or not. Uh, how confident are you that this will work and that uh, people mm -hmm. will follow that advisory? I think they will follow it. I think there's enough fear right now and understanding of how explosively contagious this disease is because we've got two years of experience already in other kinds of variants that weren't quite as contagious. So most people will follow it. And hopefully the travel industry gets on board and is, acts responsibly and uh, uh, makes its own internal policies as well. Um, we live in a liberal democracy, so we have to shy away from making hard uh, restrictions as much as we can and rely as much as we can on individual choice and responsible behavior. There may come a time when the heavy hand of the law has to intervene, but I don't think we're there yet. What more should we be doing? we got to deploy the best tools we have. And the good news here is, is that we know how to control this disease. We do it through N95 masks because COVID is airborne. We do it through ventilation improvement, MERV and um, HEPA filters. We do it through rapid testing and symptom checks. And we do it for, uh, through vaccination vaccination remains our best path out of this finally. So uh, this is a wake-up call to those who've not been vaccinated yet to get vaccinated as soon as possible and for the rest of us to line up for our booster shots. Um, we've talked a bit about travel, setting that aside for, for a moment. Uh, what about gatherings over the holidays? What's your advice? My advice is be responsible. Do not gather unnecessarily. I'm not going to tell people what to do about their personal life. If you need to see your family, you need to see your family. But try not to spread infection. If you're going to gather, do so with fully vaccinated people. Do so outdoors if you can. If you can't, then make sure there's good ventilation present. Uh, invest in something called a Corsi Rosenthal box. Google that. I think you can make it home to lower the risk. And use rapid testing to high effectiveness. If you don't have to gather, don't gather. Hmm. But if you're going to gather, do it safely. Now, let's talk about, like, we're hearing a lot uh, just in the last even 48 hours, more and more discussion around rapid testing and the need to ramp that up. Uh, more and more provinces are now expanding the distribution of rapid tests, but uh, who gets them uh, still seems a little uneven across the country. Some people forced to pay, some are not. Uh, are the rapid tests uh, an even more important tool now with Omicron, and, and what's the key to making them as effective as possible? Ooh, big questions there. This is probably the most underutilized tool in our toolbox. And by this point of the pandemic, they should be ubiquitously used. In fact, had they been used during the times of Alpha and Delta, we probably would have a much easier go of it by now. So everyone should have access and the access should be free in my mind, because as expenses go, this has a huge return on investment. And that is keeping society open and functioning. We could use rapid testing to shorten the length of isolation or exposed people. That's going to be a big concern as more and more people become exposed, more so than ever before, then we can't be taking large numbers of people out of the workforce simply because they have a, an exposure alert. So rapid testing can help shorten that path. Mm -hmm. It has to come with an education campaign so people know how to use the test accordingly and what a negative result means. It doesn't mean you're not infected. It means you're not infectious at that moment. Okay. And what's the difference so that people understand it? Well, it's possible to be infected but have such a, sl a low viral load that you're not infecting other people yet. So if you test positive on a rapid test, 
you're probably infected and infectious. If you test negative, you're probably okay to be socializing. But if you test tomorrow, you might be positive because the virus has had more time now to incubate and to replicate more. Okay. Um, uh, yesterday's fiscal update, the government promised to spend $1.7 billion more to expand the rapid test supplies and get them to the provinces. And yet we know the federal government's already shipped some 80 million rapid tests to the provinces. Only about 15 million or so have been deployed. So as much as provinces are starting to ramp up the distribution, um, uh, have they been too slow until now to deploy those rapid tests? Oh, in my opinion, absolutely. We should have been acquiring them at uh, several times that volume and pushing them out the door as quickly as we can um, to everyone everyone, every citizen. If you can empower the citizen to know their infectious status, that takes a huge burden off of public health to control outbreaks. The citizen can then limit their exposures when they know that they should not be going out. You know, so download responsibility, spread it out evenly, use democracy to its greatest advantage. All right, just, just to finish on that, uh, you know, uh, given where we are and the concerns around Omicron, um, you know, how could the widespread deployment of those tests, let's say over the next couple of weeks, uh, help to mitigate that spread or at least, you know, uh, well, I guess mitigate the spread? Well, if you know that you are infectious, you're not going to go out and socialize with other people and spread the disease further. If you know that someone in a gathering is infectious on that day, you won't be attending that gathering. So we now we remove one likely source of transmission. It's a layer of protection that will slow transmission. It won't solve the problem outright. It buys us time to solve the problem via vaccination. All right. Uh, Ray Wad Dionandan, uh, always good to talk to you. Uh, thanks again for your time tonight. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you.